Welcome to the Built to Last podcast, a community for coaches founded on the principles encourage, equip, and empower. We are performance coaches working for eternal purpose. Now, here are your co-hosts, Charlie Ray and Justin Ventavania. Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to Built to Last. We are excited to bring you guys an episode today from Coach Kyle Oshner, a.k.a. Coach Ox. Uh, he is the Director of Athletic Performance at Northwestern College. It's an NAIA school in Iowa. And um, it was a great episode talking a lot about even the academic side of things, which is something we haven't really spoke much about in the, in the, in the show so far. Um, but guys, this is uh, we're coming up actually on one year of having the podcast up and running and this ministry going full tilt. And uh, it's been a blessed first year. And um, part of the, I think one of the huge reasons why we've um, had so much success in year one is just because of the involvement from our listeners and just everyone getting involved and collaborating. And um, this episode was actually a perfect example of one of our listeners just reaching out and saying, hey, I know someone who would be a great fit for the show. Um, I spoke to Charlie about it. We, we uh, got to know our guests a little bit and, um, and it was phenomenal. And so if you guys have anybody that you think would be a great fit for the show and that we should highlight in the community, uh, please reach out to us. Our email is teambuilttolast.com or sorry, teambuilttolast at gmail.com. And our website is teambuilttolast.com. And so please feel free to reach out and uh, we'd love to connect with you. Yeah, Justin, that's a really good point. And this episode just was really special because it takes a, a different angle from an academic standpoint. So like Justin was saying, he's currently the director of athletic performance and and a professor of practice of kinesiology at Northwestern College. And he joined them back in 2012. And he was actually the first full-time strength conditioning coach that they hired. So pretty cool, unique story as to how he got there. Uh, Before that, he was at the University of Minnesota in 2011, 2012. And he also got his master's degree at Texas Tech University. And Coach Ox currently holds the SCCC certification and he's a certified mentor. So definitely sit back and enjoy this episode. You guys are going to get a lot out of it. All right, guys, we are joined this week with Coach Kyle Ochsner, uh, also known as Coach Ox. Uh, Coach, appreciate you coming on the show. Ah, oh, Thanks. Pleasure being here, guys. So, so Kyle Ochsner, uh, Coach Ox, Director of Athletic Performance, Professor of Practice of Kinesiology at Northwestern College. So everyone, I'm sure, at work knows you based off whether it be your, your title or your daily responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about who you are outside of work and the faith side of things. Do you yeah. mind going into a little bit, what's your background in, in your faith and coming to know the Lord and just touching on that a bit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So yeah, I'm the director of athletic performance and professor of practice. So, you know, I kind of fill both both hats there, right? So as you probably kind of I teach uh, and I coach as well. So which is kind of fun, right? I get to coach what I teach. But yeah, uh, my faith story and like, uh, as kind of a bunch of guests you've had, like I, I grew up in a Christian home um, and I, I'm extremely blessed to have have that situation because I know some some don't and uh, and you know I've had a, had a great family growing up that severely blessed me uh, and whatnot. But uh, yeah, born and raised in a Christian home, kind of heavily influenced through my Reformed theology here at Northwestern and right and the church that I grew up in. You know, uh, but that doesn't mean that I didn't have any kind of difficulties along the ways, right? Uh, golly, uh, many ups and downs, you know, but I think the thing that kind of helped me uh, as the years went on was having solid groups of friends throughout high school and college, right? As you, mm-hmm. as you begin mm-hmm. to leave, right, your family, you, you start kind of merging towards these other social networks, Right. And so mm-hmm. there's lots of different paths you can go down. Uh, and uh, I'm extremely blessed to say that I has just a couple core, core friends in, in high school that uh, we were able to keep up on. Now, not that we didn't get to mischief every now and then. Right. <laughs> uh, but uh, in terms of being kind of led down the right path, I had some good friends growing up in high school. And then from the Northwestern, uh, for those who don't know, it's a Christian liberal arts institution. and It's a great place for your faith to thrive. But, you know, just because it's a Christian school doesn't mean you're not going to have your challenges uh, along the way. But I like what you said too, Coach, about having great friends around you because, I mean, I even heard it once before, you know, you're the sum of the five people you surround yourself with. Yeah. And so it sounds like that was a huge influence for you having good people around you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, So kind of uh, something I kind of talk about in one of my classes, I I lead a, I guess it's kind of a, it's technically a freshman class, but our 
a core class it's called body stewardship and a lot of times we talk about uh, hmm. behavior change right and so we kind of look at like well, what does it really mean to change behavior uh and so you oftentimes they give really simple answers like oh you just gotta you know will it but really when you look at it if you want to change behavior oftentimes it doesn't really come down to your willpower because you know when it's all said done, our willpower is weak right the only person that has strong will is christ <laughs> Right. Amen. So really, ultimately, what you have to do is you have to change your environment when it's all said and done. And that's why I try and teach our students is yeah. you want to have some kind of change, right? Some physical, personal change. Like sometimes it's a matter of changing your environment. Wow. Uh, and so, that's yeah, great. if you need to yeah, have a core group of friends is something good. And I think that's something that God has always blessed me with, you know, so even through like Northwestern, I had a good group of guys that uh, we fed off each other. And then, you know, moving down to Lubbock, uh, Texas like I you know I I really had no friends you know when I that I knew down there right mm -hmm. uh but you know the Lord provided uh I, I was able to get in some good relationships with, with some guys down there were pretty solid and guys that I keep in touch with today uh and the same thing when I moved to to Minneapolis uh I actually had where, where we moved at in Minneapolis uh the guy right next door to me was he was attempting to to uh start a church and whatnot so you know that was really fun to be be involved with them and kind of yeah how they started that uh and then you know just keeping the going to church there finding a good church community to be involved with uh and then obviously moving back to order city here and it's it's a great environment it's a great environment that uh, has allowed my my faith to flourish uh, yeah just because of all the people here you know i, I know i'm blessed uh, because of where where I get to work every day and it, it's something that you know we don't have to kind of sneak around talking right because it, it's it's open like everyone can talk about it um, there's there's no like hindrances or trying to like you don't have to worry about stepping on people's toes in that regard mm -hmm. you, you guys know what I mean by that yeah it's unique because at a lot of schools yeah. it's, it's not that easy and no it's not it's and I think at all the guests we've had here, I think you might probably be, I don't know. What do you think, Charlie? Is Coach one of the first ones we've had at a, a school that's Christian-based? Well, there's been um, a few guys that have been at private Christian school, but yeah. uh, high school. But, no, you're, oh, right. I, yeah. I can agree mm -hmm. with you. Like, I'm at Houston Baptist University right now. And mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It doesn't mean – there's tons of athletes that aren't Christian. But at the same time, yeah. I know, it's, a, it's a friendlier environment to be able to be open about that. You don't have that stigma. Like, you have to kind of be – I don't know, a little mm -hmm. more secretive about it or whatever, but yeah. Yeah, I really, I really enjoy our, uh, kind of our, we have no just inhibitions, right, to kind of mm -hmm. share our faith. And I just love our mission statement. I wrote it down because I knew I'd probably forget trying to rear up from memory, but uh, our, our president says it pretty much every time we meet, which. There you go. Uh, yeah, it's a Northwestern College, a Christian academic community, engaging students and courageous and faithful learning. And living to pow that empowers them to follow Christ and pursue God's redeeming work in the world. Wow. And, and I just love it. That that is kind of the bedrock uh, of where I get to work every day. Wow. Uh, and, and yeah, and and you know, as I mentioned before, right? Because I was this is Northwestern is my alma mater, and yeah, just because you're at Northwestern doesn't necessarily mean you're a Christian, right? Mm -hmm. We get yeah. we get plenty of students, plenty of student athletes that come here because of academics, because of athletics. Uh, the faith art aspect of may not really ring to them, but you know, it, it's fun to just kind of invest in the students here. Mm -hmm. Right. And we can, we can share openly and, and uh, with them on, on that regard. So what does that look like? We know your background and strength conditioning. Mm -hmm. We know your background in academics. And then we know your background as a believer. How do you mm -hmm. tie in your faith into those two roles as a mentor, as a, as a coach, as a staff member who's leading, you know, multiple interns and that kind of stuff. And then also as a professor, I mean, how do you tie that in without just forcing it down them? And, you know, they've already heard it, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's a, it's a, it's kind of an intricate balance, right? Because you don't want to force it. You got to kind of intricately tie it in mm -hmm. uh, your faith into it. Um, but with that being said, right. I, I feel like there still has a lot to say with actually professing your faith and kind of living your faith on your sleeve, right. Being vulnerable, right. Cause anytime mm -hmm. you open your mouth, right. You're vulnerable. 
anytime you say yeah. something, you're vulnerable. And, mm -hmm. and allowing the students, you know, and your athletes to to recognize that, right? Uh, I think they appreciate that. But yeah, yeah it shows uh, that so, you're real. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, no, it shows that you're real. You know. Yeah, uh, and I I love the opportunity to just kind of speak with students on my behalf. What I really like is our, our strength and conditioning students, they're, they're a smaller group of amongst our greater body of students. So I get to develop those relationships. I think a lot, I know I've heard on your podcast multiple times, but it's relationships, man. As much as we say it, and as if you want to call it cliche at mm -hmm. this moment in time anymore, but th there's so much truth in just truly investing into relationships. Uh, I couldn't tell you how many times I've had students in my office, so kind of switching hats here, right? So we're talking about athletes and I'm talking about my students where you know, I've had students in my office that haven't been doing well in class. So I just call them in and you know, there's a reason why I have a box of tissues in my office, <laughs> right? Wow. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, the, we, we have, I don't know, we have like 1300 students. Everyone has a different background. Uh, this past uh, year, I had the privilege of teaching uh, kind of uh, one of our core freshman classes it's our every freshman has to take it uh, and have the opportunity to read this i'm gonna blank on the actual term but uh or the author was a dj she wrote a short i don't call it essay on kind of a single story right and uh i highly recommend if you have a chance to kind of read or i think she also has a youtube video about a single story um but anyways like just invest and realize that everyone has a background Right. And you can't let that one instance kind of be the defining factor for uh, perhaps kind of what you might think that person might be like, because you think you know their background. You can't let that be the defining situation. Right. If that makes sense. That makes a ton of sense. And it reminds me of when, you know, we're called not to judge people, you know, and yeah. you're judging someone based off of one circumstance. Granted, first impressions are important, you know, and mm -hmm. I tell my athletes sometimes how you handle something is how you handle everything, right? In a lot of ways, yep. the little things add up to the bigger things. But for sure, we all make mistakes. And if I'm mm -hmm. judging someone based off of one mistake, yeah, it's, it's not fair to them. But, um, but it sounds like what you're saying, Coach, it reminds me a lot about what, you know, who a great mentor would be. You know? And so yeah. switching gears a bit, I know you're a CSCCA approved mentor. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so um, you know, outside of just the X's and O's, you know, what do you think makes a great mentor? What are some like, tips for anybody who wants to grow in that area? Yeah, I think you know, we've already talked about relationships, but I think there's also a willingness to invest Mm, right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and allowing the mentee right uh to to grow right uh i've all i've often been mentored myself and one of the great mentor here at northwestern has kind of told me you know what you need you need three people in your life right uh, you need a paul a barnabas and a timothy right so uh you know paul being kind of the the mentor right barnabas being the the uh, encourager right and and uh timothy being the mentee right i like that i never uh, heard of that that's cool yeah, yeah it's awesome. a it's a great device i really i really enjoy you know like i said we have so many great guys here at northwestern and, and you know people that just kind of invest in this so yeah paul's being a mentor barnabas being the encourager and timothy being the mentee uh but you can kind of look to those like paul like i think he's a great example of just kind of pour it into people right uh and then you know what you also notice about paul is he what i love every time you read kind of his his epistles right is he thanks god every day for him right every day like when you when you open oh, yeah. up any, any one of his books like that's one of the first things like he longs for these people he wants to serve uh these you know that's all seems right or or the philippians or the people of Colossae, right he, he longs to just continue to mentor them and invest in them. But at the same time, right, he, he's, he's uh, willing to just call them out, right? I think a, a good mentor, right, you, you need to help them kind of empower your, your mentees, right? You want to, I, I love this, uh, so I'll probably say it at the end of here, but uh, I'm currently going through uh, Jacko Willink's uh, Dichotomy of leadership. Yeah, dichotomy of leadership. He's phenomenal. Um, yep. Yeah. Extreme I, I ownership. It. I mean, that book is phenomenal. Yeah, it is. It's yeah, great. I'm actually reading the uh, field tactics and strategies right now, this the second field manual. He he has oh. great stuff. 
Yeah. No, um, but I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Something about uh, something, what's his, uh, I wrote it down somewhere. I'm going to forget. I can't find it. That's okay. Uh, but something about holding people accountable, but not holding their hand. Mm. Right. Wow. I, I love that. Right. And for me, that's allowing, allowing them to embrace the struggle. So, like for instance, uh, here here's something I'll do. So when the when my when my practicum three students write a program, uh, and I'm looking through it, I'm like, this this isn't gonna work. Like this just isn't gonna work, right? From a logistic standpoint, I let them run with it. Let them learn. Right. I let them run. Yeah. I let them learn. <laughs> right. And yeah. then and then we then we get to the end and like, all right, what what did you learn from that? Right. Now, if it's something that's gonna affect the safety of my athletes, it's a different story. Uh, but I think allowing them to just kind of wrestle with that, uh, allowing people that you're mentoring to just wrestle, right? Just you can't, I think there's a lot with just kind of, you know, as we talk about going through the grind, right? Right. Kind of going through those kind of lessons and learn them on their own. I think that's sort of super beneficial when you're trying to, to, to kind of lead these up and coming professionals, uh, in strength and conditioning and in their faith, right? Uh, can't always give them the answer. Uh, my my students have learned never to ask me what's going to be on the exam. Right? <laughs> they, they they just have um, because I said I'm like I'm not going to tell you what's on the exam. Like we we've learned things. Uh, I might give you some some general guidelines, right, to maybe focus your energies, but I'm not going to tell you what's on the exam because then what was the point of me, you know, uh, providing you guys lessons over the last few weeks, right? If I'm just if you're just going to study what what's going to be on the exam and it defeats the purpose right you can be able to struggle through all the information right and you'll be you'll be examined on some of it right but you got to see it together as a whole well hopefully you're teaching them to 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 learn uh in order to grow and not just to let you know oh i need to get an a in this class that's why i'm studying to, to pass mm -hmm. it's like no you're actually studying for life like you're studying it's a great don't one. let your education get in the way of your learning you know if that makes yeah, sense and like i love point. what you're saying about the empowerment because i you know i try to do the same thing with with thin turns or that kind of stuff okay you got to warm up or something run through it and it's like they didn't think about flow they didn't think about exercise order and mm -hmm. next thing you know it's like really clogged up and you just kind of let them you know they you mm -hmm. let them struggle but you look yeah. back on when have been the times you personally have grown the most it's probably through struggle it's when you have had opportunities where man things didn't work out and you had to go and reevaluate it so I love yeah. that you're allowing them, you're creating a situation for them to fail and then to learn from it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's allowing for promoting creativity. Because if it's like, oh, no, you can't fail, then it's like, well, then they're just going to stick in this one little area right. and they're never going to mm -hmm. try anything new. And then you eliminate all creativity. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah there's so, so much you learn through the fire, right? Um, you know, you guys have done it and I've done it. But I think as just kind of circling, excuse me, back to that whole idea of being vulnerable, I, I tell them after they make a mistake, I, I think it's only possible that I tell them, hey, these are the mistakes I've made, you know, um, yeah. from, from a strength and conditioning standpoint, like I have plenty of stories where I told my students, like, I've done this, it mm. did not work. I thought it was going to work and it didn't. Uh, and I've learned lots of lessons along the ways of things that did not work. But that's honestly how you learn, right? And it's even in the same thing with like our your spiritual life, right? Sometimes you need to be willing to, to grapple and limp, right? Yeah. Uh, wrestle with things, right? And just like you want to say the it was an angel that like dislocated Jacob's hip, you gotta be able to limp through things. That's what's gonna keep you closer <laughs> to the shepherd, right? Yeah. <laughs> and like when so you get it, go ahead, it, Justin. No, no, no. And just staying on that for a second, just before we pass it up. I just read a book uh within the past year called The Culture Code. Do you guys ever read that book? I haven't. Or, I haven't. I've heard about it. If so it's by Daniel down. Coyle. Yeah, it's a really, really good book. Probably in my top five all time. And wow. I definitely read yeah, a good amount. It but uh, it's really good. And um, like two of the biggest principles about great cultures, he looks into a bunch of great cultures all throughout really the, the world and history and mm -hmm. dives into what makes them great. And two of the things he lists first are building safety right amongst your team and then sharing vulnerability. 
Wow. And so what you're saying there, again, being vulnerable, and you obviously have never even read the book, and, you, and you know, you're doing some of these things in your weight room. And so I definitely want to talk more about the culture side of things in your, at, at Northwestern College. Um, yeah. But it, he opens, Daniel Coyle opens up the book, and he gives an example of uh, an exercise where he gave the, a group of people like a marshmallow, some toothpicks, uh, and they had to get the marshmallow balanced on top of the toothpicks and to create like the highest um, fort or building that they can create. Mm -hmm. And they looked at a group of Harvard business students, I believe, and then a group of kindergartners. And actually the kindergartners won. And the reason mm -hmm. being was because the business students from Harvard were so pigeonholed in like their, like stay in your lane, do your job. Like I'm the, the talkative one. I'm the creative one. I'm the mm -hmm. leader. This person's the young guy. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't get to talk too much. And so like we said, like you said, when you let people fail and be vulnerable and share and do those things and you give them a, a culture where they're able to do those things, whether it's interns or athletes, like you said, Charlie, it's like you're setting them up for life, you know, mm -hmm. to be successful mm -hmm. in life. And so I just want to share that because that, that's what it reminded me of. And I love that you were saying that. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a, a great place. So, yeah, we're, we're a small school. And that's one thing I, I truly value here is knowing that, especially for our athletes, like often, oftentimes this is this is the last. This is the last like hurrah, right, for, yeah. for their athletic career. Yeah, we do. We do have some, um, some, you know, students that will go on to do things above and beyond here from an athletic standpoint. Mm -hmm. But one thing I try to teach them in my weight room is also kind of that that life skill. So that's why I say when we want to mold my my program to the athlete, not the athlete to the program, I want them to overall enjoy it and take some ownership in it, right? Because that'll hopefully transpire to what they do when they leave Northwestern. Yeah, And so when I also teach my classes, so I teach our, our body stewardship class, uh, the one I was talking about with behavior change. Yeah, It's one of those things that I try to get into their mind. Like you guys got to think like it's really easy for you to kind of just kind of zone in right now of what's going on in your life and not think big picture. Right. So the skills you start developing like right now, right, these behaviors that you start doing where you kind of transition your, your environments to these will ultimately impact you, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road. So what you start doing now, right, there, there's a time to plant and a time to harvest. Right now, you're planting, right? Mm. Soon enough, you, you'll be harvesting, right? And so yeah. whatever, whatever you store up, okay, or whatever you, whatever you, whatever you plant, whatever you, whatever you cultivate, whatever you nourish, right, it's just going to feed that crop for later on when you harvest. So, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I grew up on a farm, so I have some farm analogies. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. No, yeah. it reminds me of this book by um, James Clear called Atomic Habits. And he talks about tiny, remarkable habits done consistently well over time leads to major mm -hmm. change. And yeah. you really think about that. And that's actually like a biblical principle. Okay, we can choose instant gratification in the microwave society we live in, or you can choose delayed gratification, which is a more biblical approach. We're called mm -hmm. to live for eternity and not live for this world. You know, we're just strangers passing through. And so it's that same type of mentality. How can you invest in the eternal? And it's really the backbone of what Built the Last is about. We want to build them to last mm -hmm. for these four years in college, but more importantly, built to last for eternity. I mean, that's kind of like yeah. in, a, in the, the nutshell of what built to last is all about. And, and something that I wanted to go back to with what you were saying, if you look at how Jesus mentored, he led through vulnerability. I mean, he gave his life up. Mm -hmm. He led through humility and vulnerability mm -hmm. and yeah. sacrificial serving. Mm -hmm. And so he demonstrated and modeled what, the, what that looks like. But he also asked questions like he could have easily allowed Peter not to fail. He allowed Peter to fail mm -hmm. and yeah. look at Peter. He became the rock of the church, you know, and ultimately he restored him. And so through our failures, even mm -hmm. in strength conditioning, but then even more importantly, in our, our, our belief system in God and our faith, we mm -hmm. are actually restored and drawn closer to him. You think about like John 15, he prunes, he prunes mm -hmm. us, which is, it's hard but he mm -hmm. does it so that we can bear more fruit by remaining in him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. What coach, let me ask you a question based off of that, yeah. what Charlie was saying. Yeah. Yeah. Has there been a time in your life where you've maybe like, what, like if you don't mind sharing talking about yeah. being vulnerable, maybe like your biggest struggle or like the biggest challenge you've faced as a coach or as a mm, professor as a coach. And, and what you learned from that. Yeah. That's yeah. That's a great question. Um, good night. There's, there's plenty I could probably talk about. 
Uh, I think probably one of the biggest difficult lessons that I've learned, whether it be coaching or from family relationships or just relationships in general or just where God has taken me is knowing that God's plan A might be ultimately our plan G, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, like yeah. kind of going back to like how I got here to Northwestern, uh, like had God not shut my plan A and my plan B, <laughs> right? I would have never formulated a plan C, which means I would have never had teaching experience, which obviously like was a key thing for me coming back to Northwestern, right? They wanted someone that had, had taught before. And had it not been for that experience, uh, I just kind of laugh because uh, Dave Stodden, my, my academic advisor at, at Tech, he's like, I remember one of the last few days of being at Tech, he's like, do you, do you think you'd ever consider being a uh, professor at a college? I looked him straight in the eye and said, no. <laughs> and it was just kind of funny, <laughs> and here right? You are. And here I am. Here I am. Yeah. Um, wow. But I, I wow. think. I think what God has really taught me, right, is, is to be patient and to trust. Mm -hmm. And something that, uh, so I, I meet with uh, on a weekly basis, uh, our athletic department, we have a Bible study. Uh, and in that, recently we've been talking about, uh, and it's something I've really dived in or yeah, delved into, was this idea of, of praying for the process, not the product, mm. right? Um, because oftentimes, you know, uh, we often, we, we pray for what we want, mm -hmm. right? Now, I'm not saying that's that's a bad thing. Uh, you know, like, for instance, I'll just play, pray, or pray for, like, safe travels or, you know, pray that so-and-so, you know, gets better from X, Y, Z or, or pray that I get this job or, you know, or, uh, you know, if I can be really open for us, me and my wife, right? It was pray that we had a child and you know that that was that was a process that was mm -hmm. a process so when i started here in 2012 at the end of that year my wife and i were like all right we're here we're ready to have a child and so let, let's start this family <laughs> right so we we try and get the process going it takes about a year and we're super excited and like uh jay my wife had had a you know a positive test and then like literally like a few weeks later, just like a miscarriage, right? Oh, wow. And uh, so we're like, oh God, right? And then, you know, so I think, I think we're only like six weeks along at that time. So it was really, really early, but it still hurt, right? Yeah. It still hurt. Um, but after that though, it was a series of five years until, and I know there, there's other people out there that are in pain from, not being able to have children, you know, for their entire life. Uh, but it took us a good long five years. And I tell you what, every month, you know, when you think about 60 months in a row, just figuring out like just the pain and just the, the fire that God put us through. Wow. And when you, when you look back, right, that, that was the process. Did we get the product that we wanted? Uh, yeah, eventually. Oh, I have a brand new baby girl. Well, I shouldn't say she's a baby girl anymore. <laughs> she turns two in a couple in a couple months. Congratulations. But Holly, she was a blessing. She, yeah, she's congratulations. Awesome. Thanks, man. It's a. I don't know, do any of you guys have kids? I don't even know. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll be calling you when I do. <laughs> I tell you what. Becoming a father has definitely changed uh, the way I coach and the way I the way I approach things and that's a different story but uh uh it's, it's kind of funny how this kind of lines up because uh our minister this past sunday uh reverend tim breen it's awesome I, he, he's got some great stuff uh but uh he, he's talking about uh um, minimum maintenance road christianity so what you know trying to eliminate this idea of doing the bare minimum Right, and in this past past Sunday, you talked about needing to have to wrestle, right, um, and grapple to have that deep faith, right, and you need to meet God in seasons of darkness and pain, mm -hmm. and uh, God doesn't always play nice, right? He doesn't give you what you expect, 
right? And, and sometimes, right, we have to wrestle and suffer to see it. Uh, and I, yeah, it, it's hard because, right, um, in those times, right, God's not who we, who we want him to be, but he is what he is, right? And then when you, when you look back and, and look at your journeys that you've taken, yeah, you see why he did it, right? And, and it's easy to give up. I mean, it is, right? Um, but, you know, kind of relating to that, that story of Jacob, right? Um, when he wrestles and wrestles and wrestles with the angel and finally, right? Like the sun sets on on Jacob and the sun rises to Israel, right? The end of the end of the day, right? And from then on, you know, uh, he has that limp. And then I, uh, it's kind of a great resource. Uh, Hebrews eleven twenty one, I think, is what he referenced, is when Jacob at the end of his life, right, is is resting on his staff, right? Because he he was gimp, he was limping, right? Sometimes the limping Christians, they're the greatest resource. Right, because they're they're the ones that have kind of dug dug into their wound. I don't know if you guys have ever read uh, "Wild at Heart" by John Eldridge. Yes. Yep, incredible book. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyways, he in, in that book he kind of talks about entering the wound, right? And uh, yep. one one quote um, from there, I can't remember it quite really well, but it has something to do with uh, like true strength doesn't come out of being brave right? Uh, and until we are broken, right? Or our life, until we're broken, I think uh, something about our life will be still self-centered, self-reliant, and our strength will be our own, right? And we can't rely on our own strength. We can only rely on God's strength. Just kind of going back to what we talked about, behavior change and, and whatnot, like our, our willpower is pretty weak. Our willpower is pretty weak. So we got to be able to to change those environments and kind of see kind of a little of a bigger picture, I believe, to get get to that deep faith, right? Sometimes you got to grapple with God to get that deep faith. Uh, what I was talking about in John 15, I mean, an amazing passage, but he talks about, apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is talking, saying, mm -hmm. apart from him, like, we can do nothing. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, it's just an incredible truth to remember that, like, yeah, his grace is sufficient, and it's by him and through him and to him that all things, you know, we, we are motivated to work for his glory. Mm -hmm. uh, Coach, my last question for you, Coach Ox, just regarding kind of the mentorship role that you have and, yeah. and thinking about, you know, the listeners, some, some of the young strength coaches that are listening to this, what would mm -hmm. be your, your advice that you would want to give to them? Mm. Great question. Um, I think one of the first bits of advice I would say was to find the Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy in your life right? And then be those, right? Be those, be those things for, for other people. Uh, and then I'm also reminded a little bit of this uh, acronym that one of the other sport coaches here at Northwestern has given me. It's called RACE, right? And the, the idea there is to uh, reject passivity, accept responsibility, live courageously, and then expect adversity and expect the greater reward. That is awesome. Right. Uh, yeah. Like I said, it's uh, those, especially that, that last little bit, right. Expect adversity. Right. And kind of, kind of tailing back into like the typical lessons I've learned, right. You, you got to expect it. And, and I think there's a lot of value in learning from people that have those, those gimping Christians, right. That we talked about. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so that kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, Joshua twenty four fifteen, right, where it says basically you got you got to choose who you're going to serve, right? You yeah. got to choose who you're going to serve. When, when you're going through this life as a young aspiring strength coach, right, you got to choose who you're going to serve. What, what are you going to chase, right? What are you going to chase? Mm -hmm. um, choose your service, right? And Joshua, right, twenty four fifteen, right, says for me and my household, right, we're going to we choose to serve the Lord, um, and then. Uh, kind of a little bit of first Corinthians 20 or nine, 24 through 27, right. Where he's talking about the need for self-discipline. What's crazy is I actually had that passage pulled up on my screen because you had said something, you said something earlier that reminded me of that passage. But if you look at the verses before it uh, verses, so first Corinthians nine twenty two, it says, 
to the weak, I became weak that I may yep. win the weak. I have become all things to all men yep. so that I may by all possible means save some. And then he mm -hmm. says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. And so mm -hmm. that was going back into what you were saying, become all things to all men, be vulnerable, ask the why when your athlete is late, when your student is late or whatever, something's going on, you mm -hmm. step into their world and become all things to all men so that you may win them to Christ. But then the next verse, it says, do you not know that we all run races, but only one receives the prize? And then it's the verse you quoted. We need to run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it not to receive something that's perishable, but something that's imperishable. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of crazy. You quoted that. And yeah. I'm thinking, okay, yeah, we need to run with such a race with perseverance and fight this good fight, you know? Yeah. And that's the thing like, that me and my pastor ju were just talking about this past weekend too. It's crazy. This is coming up because <laughs> even talking about it. Yeah. It's pretty cool because we're talking about sharing our faith with people and yeah. trying to help people along and making an impact, building lasting athletes, lasting relationships. Right. And the first thing we have to do is establish common ground, right? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing we have to do, whether it be just with your coworkers or like you said, coach Ox, right. And if, if an athlete comes in late, we have to establish common. If we want to make a real impact on them, like an actual life changing impact to help them grow from that. But mm -hmm. we have to establish common ground first. And like you said, ask them why they're late instead of just flipping your top, mm -hmm. you know, why are you late? And then from there, right. Then we can run to win, right. Then we mm -hmm. can actually make an impact that lasts for eternity, hopefully, because we've established common ground before just saying, change this, do this, do this differently you know, establish mm -hmm. common ground first, but th that's awesome. Mm -hmm. It's funny that all three of us kind of are yeah. thinking of the same things there. Yeah. You kind of need to be humble and hungry, right? You got to be humble. You got to be humble to, for, from your background, your past experiences and, and whatnot, but you still got to be hungry to strive after, right? You got to run the race, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You can do all the training, but eventually you get, you're going to have to lace it up and, and run the race, right? That, that Paul talks about. Um, oh, yeah. Cause you, you can't finish if you don't run. <laughs> I love it. Wow. That's the truth. Right, and yeah. coach, speaking of finishing, we do something called the fast, fin fast finishers uh, on every episode. Ah, yeah, yeah. We're talking about books a lot. So I definitely want to hear if you have like a favorite one, but our fast finishers are uh, favorite book, favorite verse or story from the Bible. And how do you define success? Ah, great questions. Oh, so thanks for asking. Ah, favorite books, man. I've obviously referenced a few already. Uh, maybe I'll just list off some of the ones I've already kind of Kind of, or that I'm currently reading. Uh, yeah. I'll say this: I did, I did just recently finish this one. In fact, uh, I read it for the second time this past year. I think someone already mentioned it. Uh, I think it might have been Keefe had mentioned this book on on your very first episode. Was in a pit with a lion, a snowy day by Oh Mark yeah, Patterson. Mark Patterson. Right. Yeah, I read that. So I read it by myself about this time last year, and then last semester uh, with our coaches, we we read that as our Bible study. I just love the concept, just locking eyes with your lion, man. That, there's nothing, there's nothing more fierce about that, and wanting you to get get after it than locking eyes with your lion. Um, but uh, some of the ones I'm currently reading right now, uh, I'm assuming we have some some young younger listeners on on this podcast. Uh, but I would say definitely a good one to read would be "How to Ruin Your Life by 30" by Steve Ferrar. Uh, so <laughs> okay. here, here at Northwestern, um, we have this kind of this half hour time frame on Mondays, uh, and myself, I kind of help, but I definitely don't lead it by any means, but I assist the two main, two main, uh, coaches here at Northwestern. We call it Monday mornings for men. So basically what we're trying to do is, is create men, right? Good Christian men that will lead their families and lead, lead their occupation to wherever they go. Uh, but this That's is an awesome this is a, idea. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's so much fun. It's Man so up fun. Mondays. <laughs> yeah. We call it, we call it a uh, meeting the garage uh, and whatnot, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's awesome. We get like, uh, it kind of ebbs and flows. But yeah. I'd say we, we get close to on some days, like 70 men in there. And it's wow. really awesome because wow. there's coaches in there. There's other uh, men from the community that come together and just for a half hour mentor the, the these young you know, it's college age kids, right? But that's that's kind of the book they're going through right now. And uh, even though, yeah, I'm already in my 30s, uh, but I tell you what, there are some really good life lessons in there. Uh, so I haven't Sounds fully fantastic. completed it yet, but I highly recommend it. 
uh, some really good tidbits of information. Uh, so how to ruin your life by 30. Uh, another one that I'm kind of battling through right now uh, is St. Augustine's Confessions. Um, I'm reading the, okay. the, the Henry Chadwick translation. Uh, that's, a, that's a slower process. It's a, it's a, lot, of, <laughs> a lot of stuff to grasp onto, but I, I, I enjoy the challenge. Uh, nice. So that's kind of my, my daily devotional book that I, that I read. Um, and then kind of my, my before bedtime read. I'm rereading uh, Wild at Heart, the one that I kind of quoted before by John Eldridge. Yeah. And then kind of my evening read is my The Dichotomy of Leadership. I'm almost done with that one. It's really good. I've learned a lot of really good tidbits in that. Um, if nothing else, look at the table of contents in that book, and you'll have a lot of good bullet points for your leadership and life tips. Um, but I, I highly encourage get into the meat in that book. I think Jacko does some great stuff in that book. And, and Leaf, I think he's also a co-author of that. Um, and then one book that I finished, you want to talk about stuff that has to do more training, <laughs> I guess you could say. Um, it's not necessarily a training book, um, 100%, but Good to Go by Christy Ashwanden. I don't know if you guys have ever read that or whatnot. No. Uh, I was listening to, about a year ago, I was listening to the the Art of Manliness podcast by Brett McKay. Yep, great podcast. And yeah, it's awesome. That's uh, it's a, a good one to listen to. But anyways, he had I'd never ever heard of this book, and he, he interviewed her, and I was like, man, that sounds really. It talks a lot about like uh, training modalities and recovery modalities. Uh, but she has offered some great input on some some recovery modalities that we utilize in strength and conditioning. But yeah, I've read it. I've read it about twice this past year and it's it's a really really good read so i highly recommend that one so yeah that would be kind of the books that i'm reading ones that i recommend and obviously there's a lot more <laughs> out there but yeah those books would be the ones cool and then uh favorite bible verse or story favorite. from the bible oh boy yeah i have quite a few but if i'm to think of one that kind of for all intents and purposes gives a little bit of a personal touch based on my my nickname and what most people call me <laughs> <laughs> right it is uh that time when elijah calls elisha right and you think of like first kings i think it's 19 uh kind of right at the end of the chapter right where elijah calls on elisha right and what does elisha do right he, he slaughters his 12 yoke of oxen and burns <laughs> the plow yeah like how how crazy is that so that just reminds me of like when you think about taking up your cross and self-denial like that's 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 what I mean. It has that kind of personal touch because people call me Coach Ox, and here this you know Elisha's just slaughtering these oxen, right? <laughs> and then and then he then he's then he's chopping up this plow, right, to cook the meat on it. <laughs> um, but the, I also like it because it to me it kind of foreshadows a little bit of kind of Christ's calling for us to be disciples. And in Luke nine, you know, twenty three through twenty six, uh, I think it's something like. And he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves right, and take up their cross daily, right? Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Mm. But those who lose it, lose their life for my sake, will save it, right? Uh, I, I just love, love that, just that kind of constant reminder of like daily slaughtering my oxen, right? And burning, burning my plow, right? So denying myself and kind of burning my past, right? Things that we've learned from. Um, now, not to say that we need to forget about them, but, you know, when we think of our faith journeys, sometimes the things that really bog us down mm -hmm. is things that we're dragging that we should just drop, right? It's meaning yeah, that yeah. that's the plow, right? You know, mm -hmm. when, when, we're, when we're training our athletes what's, and they're running real slow, what's one of the first things we say to them? Drop the plow, right? Like, release the plow because they're just, they're just going so slow. So, <laughs> obviously, that's, you think of, like, things that are just holding you back. Right, that's wow. the plow. So we need to burn it. Just burn it. Um, so yeah, I'd say that'd be one of my my personal favorite. That's great. I got to go back and read over that one again. That's awesome. Yeah, it's kind of you know uh, Elijah just comes over and basically just sets his cloak on Elisha and says, "Let's go." <laughs> yeah. You know? And then and then yeah, that's that's just kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, that's I want to say it's First Kings nineteen is where that's at. Cool. And then coach, last one, how do you define success? I know it's a tough question. It is a tough question. So I'm sure you can get lots of answers. 
Um, when I think about it, I think a lot of times it's when you can permanently repair and seal the hole in your bucket. And what I mean by that, right, is you go from being drained to overflowing and pouring out, right? So, wow. Envision like, yeah, you're a bucket, right? And, you know, you're trying to fill it up, you're trying to fill up, um, if you want to be successful, right? And whatever your occupation is or whatever your goal is at in life, right? And we try to put all these earthly things in this hole, right? Mm -hmm. That's just kind of leaking, 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 right? And then, you know, you patch it in with some kind of materialistic thing, but, you know, eventually that thing, that patch, it's going to wear out. Right, whether it be money, whether it be any kind of other physical reward, yep. right? Eventually, it's going to wear out. Yep. And you're going to get drained again, mm -hmm. and then you're going to try and fill it in another, another mm -hmm. earthly mm -hmm. thing. But it, until you, until you fill that that hole, right, with Christ, right, um, that's a permanent seal, and so that's going to allow you to do. It's going to allow your bucket to fill up, right? It's going to let you dive into Him, learn more about Him, and then. Before you know it, his blessings are filling that bucket up. Before you know it, now you, right, are overflowing, right, and then pouring out God's blessings to everyone else around you uh, and just kind of allowing his kingdom work to flourish. So if I had to define success, I'd say fixing the hole in your bucket. That's phenomenal. Yeah, yeah I've never heard anybody define success that way. That's yeah, awesome. That was great. Um, um, hey, Coach Ox, if people wanted to get in touch with you, okay, you talked about a Paul, Paul, Barnabas, Timothy, that type of stuff. Uh, yeah. Maybe somebody wanted to reach out to you. How would they, how would they uh, uh, contact you? Yeah, probably the, the easiest way would maybe be my, my email. Uh, that's just K-O-C-H-S-N-E-R at nwciowa.edu. Uh, I also, I'm, I'm doing a lot better on Instagram. <laughs> That's probably, probably, I know that's where you guys first reach out to me and that I'm better now at responding to those, but uh, that's a, just Coach Ox. Uh, well, I think there's an underscore in there. Yeah, Coach underscore Ox. I think the underscore is important. It might be someone else. Uh, <laughs> you can reach out to me on Instagram. Yeah, I have, I have a, a public account, so feel free to reach out to me there. Uh, and then I, I'm assuming they can, yeah, find me. You can go to our website, Northwestern's website. Uh, I think it's just nwciowa.edu. If you go to academics, you know, you can find kinesiology. Uh, you can find my name under those contacts and find my email uh, and all that stuff. So, yeah, those are probably some of the, the better ways to get a hold of me. So my email and maybe Instagram would be a first place to kind of start. And then I probably would transition it over into a different uh, media. But, yeah. Yeah. No, this is an incredible episode. I mean, I got a lot out of this. I just sense a meekness and a humility about you. So I just want to say thanks for coming on the show. And we're trying to close all our shows by praying for our guests. So, so mm -hmm. Coach Ox, you know, lastly, is there anything we could be praying for you about? And I'd like to close us by just doing a little prayer for you. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I would love that. Uh, yeah, like right now, at, where our, our students are currently on spring break. And uh, you know, we have a unique opportunity at Northwestern where we do SSPs and there's this spring service partnerships. So mm -hmm. our students, we have like 200 students plus that are, you know, spread throughout the United States, Mexico, Europe, that are just doing, uh, I guess you could say missional work, right, yeah. during their spring break. That's awesome. Uh, so I would just ask for God's guidance during their, their, their process while they're out there, um, that they will learn from it. Right, um, because it's really awesome. Is usually ends up happening. The students are the ones that that get blessed through these processes. I've had the opportunity to lead a couple of them as a faculty leader, and it, it, it's awesome to see what God works throughout that entire entire week. Um, I think, uh, given the current situation, the day that we're filming this, uh, I think it's be a good good idea to keep those people that are near Nashville. Uh, and our thoughts and prayers about the tornado that ripped through there mm -hmm. late, or I guess, yeah, late last night. Um, I don't, can't remember if we have any teams out that way, but golly, I, I couldn't imagine just that kind of sorrow that happens in just that quick of a, I think it was like five minutes it happened in. Um, and then, yeah, I think, I 
I can't really think of anything else top of my head, guys. Uh, maybe they just said the relationships here at Northwestern and and uh, I guess outside of this this area just continue to grow and flourish. Awesome. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and pray us up. Yeah. Uh, dear Lord, thank you so much for Coach Ox and for him coming on the show and for um, just us being able to have the resources, getting connected, Lord, through uh, divine appointments, being able to do this episode today. Lord, I want to pray a special blessing over the – the students, Lord, that are doing the spring break mission trips and the service opportunities, God, all across Mexico, U.S., and Europe, I pray, God, that you would just show up in a unique way and that you would reveal yourself to them. Um, I pray, God, that their hearts would be changed and that they would be softened to your grace. Lord, I pray for um, for Coach Ox, that you would bless him with his opportunities to uh, to be a mentor, to be a coach, to be a father, a husband. I pray for just his relationship. Lord, that he would be seasoned with with um, the salt of grace and that he would be gentle and also loving in his communication, Lord, and help him to continue to be bold for his faith, Lord, representing you as an ambassador of you, Christ. Um, Lord, thank you for just his wisdom and his humility, being able to be vulnerable with us today, Lord. Um, and just I pray that you'd bless him in his relationships, God, allow them to, to flourish and, and thrive. And lastly, God, we do pray for those that are in Nashville that have been affected through the tornado. God, we know you're in control, you're sovereign, you have a plan behind everything, God. And so I pray that uh, that we will trust you, that those in Nashville will, tr will, will trust you, Lord. And also, Lord, that this will just be an example of um, how you are working all things for your glory, God, even though something as tragic as that, God. I just pray that you turn people back to their first love, a relationship with you, God. So, Lord, thank you for today. Bless us as we go about our activities and uh, bless our listeners, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Coach, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. It was an honor and a blessing. Thank you for listening to the Built to Last podcast, where we encourage, equip, and empower coaches to live out their core values where they live, work, and wherever they build relationships. Have a blessed day, striving to build lasting impact.